The Susan Brenda Show is a radio show online broadcasted on YouTube across the United States and globally. The show features guests who speak about health, spirituality, entertainment, and a host of subjects to enlighten people across the nation. Listen to the show that empowers women and men alike and highlights those who have made a difference. I'm Susan Brender, and this is The Susan Brender Show. You know, today's guest is a very interesting man. His name is Les Standerfoot, and he takes us under the big top behind the curtain in this richly researched and thoroughly engaging narrative that captures all the entrepreneurial intrigue and spirits of the American circus. And what is more interesting than that? The American circus, which unfortunately our young people today don't get to see. Now, millions have sat under the big top, he says, watching as trapeze artists glide and clowns entertain. And there is so much more in his book but he's going to tell us a little bit more about it. So I want to welcome Les Standerfoot for being on the Susan Brender Show. Thank you so much, Susan. My pleasure to be here. You know, Les, I'll tell you something. You have been an author of 25 books. Now, when did you get the time to do all of that? Because, wow, that is really amazing. You know, it's uh, sometimes I find it hard to believe myself. When I was a kid, I was a, a great procrastinator. And uh, I found out when you write a book, uh, it doesn't work very well that way. You might be able to write a poem or a short story if you wait till you really feel inspiration. But, uh, you know, you don't get a book out that way. You sit down at the desk every day and some days are you get a little more done than, than others, but that's the way it has to be. And she's like part of growing up, I guess. You know, I'll tell you something, Les. I remember when I was very young that my parents took me to the circus and it was such an exciting opportunity for me. It was just really, I mean, the only word I can say is exciting. So what happened to the circus? Why did it disappear? Well, I think that it was uh, if if you if you ask the uh, circus men themselves, they'd say uh, they the Feld family came out. I was the last performance of the Ringling Brothers combined show back in 2017, and the Feld family came out in mass. It looked like well, the counting the grandchildren uh, and the great grandchildren looked like the a small high school graduation class and uh, they talked, uh, Erwin Feld uh, talked, or Kenneth Feld talked about the, the uh, 75 years that the Feld family had, had tried to keep the circus going after they bought it from the Ringling heirs in the, in the 1960s. And they said it was always a labor of love, but they'd managed to keep their heads barely above water until the previous year when they had finally turned the elephants out to pasture at the behest, of, you know, under pressure from animal activists uh, uh, to, to do that. And they said uh, that was the end. When the elephants left, attendance fell off a cliff. And a hundred years before P.T. Barnum had proclaimed when attempting to entertain the American public, it is best to have an elephant. And uh, those words were apparently prophetic. With the, uh, once the elephant, uh, the elephants went, uh, so went the circus with it. Yeah, uh, what a shame that is. Now there was talk. There were other things, of course, as I mean, the, uh, the, the nature of entertainment for 150 years or more, the circus had popular entertainment all to itself in the United States. This was before Major League Baseball and football franchises and, and giant amphitheaters. This was before television and, and, uh, and radio and streaming and uh, video games and, and the like. 
uh, now people get a lot of their entertainment one-on-one -on -one from their telephone uh, sitting in a room all by themselves. But back in the day, the glory days of the circus, you would be shoulder to shoulder with 10,000 people watching amazing things happen right before your eyes. And I might add, might add that everything that you saw take place in the circus really happened. There were no special effects. It was not a magic show, not like the movies where they can leap over tall buildings in a single bound. All the amazing and impossible stuff that happened in the circus really happened and human beings did it. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you something, Les. As I said before, the experiences that I had were just marvelous. I, you know, I never forgot it, but I, you know, one of the things that I find very interesting is the fact that today everything is digital. You know, we're missing something, Les, don't you think? I mean, why, you know, people are on their phones, kids are on their phones, they're on the computer, they're, you know, on Facebook and all the different social media platforms, but there is nothing more interesting than face to face, and particularly with animals, you know, animals are just they're really exciting and very interesting to watch. So I say to you, I, I used the expression a moment ago, and the narrative really is, what a shame. So let's let's kind of jump forward. Now, you write a lot about history, and the way you do it is so interesting and very compelling. Reading one of your books is like reading a novel. Now, that, you know, that leads me to asking you, uh, wouldn't it be interesting to tell the story of the people who started the, the circus, the Ringling and Brothers Barn and Bailey? Who, who are they and why did they get involved in this? Well, uh, they, they were the most ordinary of, of people in their upbringing and uh, small town folks of, of no means to, to speak of. Uh, Barnum grew up almost penniless in Connecticut. The Ringlings uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, they they uh, now Barnum did not get into the circus uh, uh, game until he was uh, nearly seventy years old. But the the Ringlings, there were seven brothers, and they all went to a circus that came to their little town by uh, on on a steamboat got off the Mississippi River uh, uh, steamboat, and these kids trooped in there, paid their, uh, their 10 cents to watch the circus, and they came out amazed, like you were talking about being amazed. And they said, this is the most incredible thing we've ever seen. Let's make a circus of our own. Now, can you imagine the oldest one of them was 14? They put a circus together. They charged their neighbors a penny. They made a profit of about $5 in that first season. And that was the beginning. They never stopped. Uh, John Ringling was five at the time, his oldest brother, 14. And they kept at it from that point on until they became the, the most successful circus entrepreneurs in the whole wide world. Imagine that. It, by dint of sheer application. They were not even the most talented uh, uh, people in the world, but they, had, they loved the circus so that they wanted to pass along the gift to everyone else in, in the world and make it even better. And, uh, uh, and Barnum too, he had, you know, this is a guy who'd uh, made a fortune exhibiting what we call human oddities today, including Tom Thumb, the, the smallest man in the world. He mm -hmm. took him not only around the United States to great acclaim, but before every crowned head of Europe. And uh, ultimately had retired from show business when somebody came to say, Mr. Barnum, you're a showman through and through. You need to come back into the game and come into the circus, and he did. And for about 15 years before the Ringlings finally hit their stride, he was the master uh, circus man. And uh, when the two went head to head, it was bitter business battles for sure, but the result of that was to propel 
the circus to untold heights that it had never reached before because they both both parties were trying so hard to outdo one another uh going to europe and and trying to find new talent and uh and things like that it it made the circus and it was a bad it was like a super bowl uh, contest every season when the barnum and uh show and the ringling show would tour and go head to head in the, in the major city. You know, Les, one of the things that I have heard before, and I don't know if it's true, but I'm curious to know, there have been people who said that the animals were taken advantage of. And when I say that, the narrative really is that they were abused. Was there any truth to that at all? I ran across no documented evidence of any grieved animal abuse in the major shows, in the Barnum show, the Ringling show, the Bailey shows. Those were uh, under scrutiny back in, in the, well back into the 19th century. The ASPCA, head of the ASPCA heard that uh, that uh, Barnum was having his horses jump through hoops of fire at Madison Square Garden and wrote him a telegram telling him he wanted that practice stopped. And Barnum said, sir, would you come on down tomorrow afternoon? I'd like to show you something. So this fellow goes over to Madison Square Garden, walks in and Barnum greets him and he sees horses in the ring and he sees some hoops uh, set up and he began to get a little nervous and Barnum said, don't worry, I wanna show you something. And he gave the high sign to one of the roustabouts. All of a sudden, it looked like the hoops had burst into flame. And Barnum walked down to the ring and stepped in uh, side and stuck his arm into that flame and showed the director of the AC ASPCA that it was confetti, red, shining confetti that looked like flame. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, at that point, the two became friends. Barnum ended up on the board, uh, the national board of the ASPCA. Uh, he was a great champion of animal rights. Yeah. I certainly wouldn't campaign to put elephants back in the circus. That's not what they were born to do. And nobody would uh, claim that I think that lions and tigers, I, you know, history, we, uh, uh, retrospect, uh, Retrospective assessment is all, hindsight's always 100% accurate. We know a lot more now than we did 100 years ago about how animals ought to be treated. And uh, yet, and for all that, this was uh, the golden age of the circus was long before major cities had zoos. This was the first opportunity that many of the United States citizens had to see things like giraffes and tigers and lions and elephants. And uh, uh, there was also, and I'm sure you were aware of this when you were a kid, when you went in and saw a trainer and an animal work together and do these amazing things, apparently communicating at a level that, you know, you would have thought impossible before you walk in, into that tent. It made you feel something about the possibility of, of life, the very thought that two species, <laughs> that a human species could communicate with an animal somehow literally is uplifting to most people. It's incredible, uh, yeah. just as it is to watch the acrobats do these impossible things. It makes you feel, and I, I believe this is why the circus was uh, so important. The circus grew up with the country and the country was founded upon the premise that here human beings could do anything with hard work and dedication a little bit of intelligence, a little bit of talent. It's why they're still knocking the doors down at the borders trying to get in here because this is the place where miracles can happen. And sitting in the circus for three hours on a hot summer afternoon was an object lesson in watching the impossible become real. And people walked out of there like later they walked out of movies saying, wow, I could be like that cowboy. I could be a hero. I could be something. I could do something special. And that's what the circus gave us. 
Yeah. You know, Liz, I'm wondering, did you ever think of going into schools and talking about this particular story? Because I think that children, they're not educated about a lot of different things. There's all kinds of problems going on today. You know, they don't even let them go to school half the time, but when they do, <laughs> when they do, wouldn't it be interesting for you to talk to them and tell them about this amazing thing that went on for so long? And I also want to say that if people go to the west coast of Florida, there's a Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. Um, I want to call it a museum, if you will, but they can see what happened during those particular days. So it's at the Ringling Museum and uh, over there in Sarasota, it's it belongs on your bucket list if this is of any interest to you at all. Amazing place, uh, totally amazing. And the story of the these particular people who got involved in this is also very interesting. And you tell that story so well. Now, let's talk a little bit about Les Standerfoot. Les, you know, when you thought about writing this story, um, was there something else that really motivated you to talk about this? Because, again, We've kind of covered this a little bit, but you're such a creative man and you could, you've written so many books, but this one stands out and this one is probably an amazing thing for people to read. So tell us about you. I'd like to know about you and I'd like to know, I'm sure our audience wants to know about Standerfoot. Who are you? Tell us about yourself. I'm a kid who grew up in a small mining and manufacturing town on the edge of Appalachia back in southeastern Ohio called Cambridge. And there was a circus that would come to Cambridge uh, uh, every summer. It wasn't the Barnum and Bailey Circus. It was about the fourth string circus that came through. But it didn't matter that they only had one elephant and the bear was a little flea bitten and the and none of the clowns uh, smiled very much. It, it was still this incredible thing. Just, uh, you know, one elephant was good enough for me. And the, I, I was fascinated with, by, uh, by the, the fun and the exoticism that what the circus said to me in a nutshell was, there's a whole big, wide, wonderful world out there and you need to go find out about it. You know, it, it was still operative myth. Uh, if you didn't like uh, your life, you could run away and join the circus. And I don't know that a lot of people did, but it operated in, mytholo in, in my mind to tell me, boy, there's, there's a great, vast world that you need to, to learn about, son. And that led me out of Cambridge ultimately and uh, to uh, graduate school and, and believing that I could be a writer. Uh, and uh, geez, uh, I, I, I tell people that uh, every now and again, I feel like a kid who grew up always wanting to be a fireman and I woke up one day and, and lo and behold, I was one. The, uh, the, the fact that I've been able to write these books uh, that people seem to be somewhat interested in is, is miraculous to me. Same thing as if I'd wanted to be a magician, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know, let's talk a little bit about one of your nonfiction books. Um, it's called The Man Who Invented Christmas, and uh -huh. it has been written for the screen. Now, wow, that is really something else. I want to uh, understand a little bit more about that. Uh, share your experiences with the people in our audience, if you will. Well, among the other things that I was fascinated with when I was a kid was holidays. I was a great uh, uh, fan of every holiday there was. Part of it was because I'd been born two minutes before Halloween, and my mother always celebrated my birthday on Halloween, I think, to save on decorations. You know, we could have a, a pumpkin would do for whatever was going to be on the table. And uh, at any rate, it got me in, uh, into the spirit. We celebrated every uh, holiday, and I mean celebrated. And Dickens, too, was a big uh, holiday nut. And uh, that he got the idea to write A Christmas Carol and saved his career. 
he was ready to give it all up, chuck it all and go become a travel journalist and decided I got this idea about this ghost story for Christmas. And he went to his publisher and they said, ghost story of, about Christmas Dickens. That's a terrible idea. Let's put out some of your old work in an in a anthology. That'll get you a little money. It made Dickens so mad that he published it himself. It took three months to write it, get it into the, uh, get it published and into stores. And it, of course, immediately sold out. And from that day on, Christmas was little celebrated in the, in the Western world at the time. It, it grew, the holiday grew and grew and grew to become the behemoth it was today. And that's where the title came from, the, the man who invented Christmas. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but as far as I'm concerned, not by much. That was Charles Dickens' enduring gift to us. And I just thought that people didn't appreciate that uh, quite enough, that they had uh, you know, had forgotten just how important that little story w uh, was and how it changed the world. And I thought I'd do my best to to bring that magical experience of Dickens alive. It was one of those things where he was convinced he could make the world take note of this holiday and look at what he did. Yeah. It worked out. Yeah, it did, sure did. Now, one of the things that you're also doing or was part of if you will you founded the chair you you were the founding chair of the florida international university's creative writing program and you're still teaching you know how does that fit into all of the things that you're doing well it keeps me inspired you know i go in and and i uh i teach those kids and i see them get uh inspired and chase after an idea and it you know it reminds me of why we all do it it's like i said we're a little bit like uh, uh magicians we we want people to stop and uh we we want to tell them look 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 here look at look at what i have to tell this listen to the story i have to tell you and uh, because most of us were enthralled by books as children ourselves so uh, just as if we'd gone to the magic show and watched the guy saw the pretty lady in half and wanted to do it ourselves. So that's that's what we're all doing. And I watched them do it uh, and 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 begin to hit their stride in their 20s. And it just remind, reminds me of how much fun it is. And, and uh, you know, it's not exactly a whole lot like work, Susan. It's a lot yeah. of fun is what it is. Oh, well, that's great. I mean, what is coming up for you? You've written 25 books already. You're part of, you know, teaching at a university here in Florida. You, you've done, I mean, almost everything that I can imagine has made you happy. But there must be something coming up that you are planning. So what is it? Is there anything special that's coming up? I'm work working on a book right now that's called Seven Dogs to Enlightenment. And it's a memoir. Uh, uh, the subtitle would, would be something like How the Breeds Have Trained Me. A lot of books about how people have trained their dogs. Uh, I'm talking here about how dogs have been my boon companions all my life and gotten me through some pretty tough places. And uh, that's what I'm right in the midst of. A little different, but I'm enjoying it very much. Well, it's been a great a conversation with you, uh, Les. I, I want to tell you that I find you so interesting, and I thank you so much for being on my show because I don't always have people like you who tell and have experienced what you've experienced and are doing such a wonderful job with young people. So thank you again for being on the Susan Brenda Show. It's been a pleasure. Um, well, thank you for the kind words and for having me, Susan. It was uh, great fun. Thank you.